welcome to Philip Capital Weekly Market Watch. I'm Lindsay from Philip Securities Research. Today, we will be looking into Indonesia and its underlying macro fundam fundamentals. On July 9th, Indonesians went to polls to choose a successor to President Susilo Bambang, you all you know, who will step down in October this year. There are two candidates, one, Jakarta, the Jakarta governor, Joko Widodo, whom also known as Jokowi, or the former military commander, Prabowo Subianto. Essentially, the two candidates offered similar proposals to boost growth, that is, spend on infrastructure, rein in costly fuel subsidies, and build up Indonesia's value-added industries, which include to maintain Indonesia's ban on mineral oil exports, but with differences only in their respective approaches. As of early this morning, Jokowi is leading Prabowo after 97.5% of total votes tallied from the election, with Jokowi securing 52.9% of the total votes counted, according to a website that tracks actual results at polling stations that are uploaded to the General Election Commission website. Both candidates have suggested the other was cheating. However, the Elections Commission will still go ahead to announce the official results as per schedule by tomorrow, which is July 22nd. Candidates can then challenge it in the Constitutional Court after the announcement, which also means weeks of further delays in formally announcing a new president. According to Reuters, some analysts estimated that Prabowo would need a change up to 7 million votes to gain victory. Regardless of who wins, in order to progress and reach sustainable growth, the next president will first need to create jobs to reduce poverty. The economy will need to grow at a, an annual rate of 7% to create jobs, up from 5.8% in 2013. There are two major sources of funds for the government spending to boost growth. One, government budget. Two, is via the Foreign Direct Investment FDI. Government budget. It is stipulated in the law that the fiscal deficit should not exceed 3% of GDP. The government set a 2014 fiscal deficit target of 2.4% GDP and on the budget front, the government is actually at risk of breaching its target on fuel subsidies. Fuel subsidies are among Indonesia's biggest budget expenditures at about 30.3% of government expenditure in 2012. Therefore, it will be necessary to cut fuel subsidies for the second time to provide the fiscal room for the infrastructure spending. In light to the above, both candidates have pledged to rein in fiscal deficit by cutting fuel subsidies and we are expecting the measures to kick in soonest by early next year. The second source, FDI. Due to budget constraints, Opening up to FDI and portfolio investment will be the key to boost economic activity. However, investment growth rates are slipping. Total foreign direct investment realization annual growth rate was at 17.7% last year, moderating from 2012's 13.03%. Nevertheless, the Indonesian Investment Coordinating Board is optimistic that the investment, both foreign and domestic direct investment, in Indonesia can reach 450 trillion rupiah in 2014 or a 15% increase from investment realization in 2013. The record high in the first quarter suggests that it is on pace to top 2013's $25 billion by end of this year. Having said that, there are few risks to monitor. The weakness in both budget and current account which previously pressured the rupiah to plunge 21% last year, have no doubt improved after Bank Indonesia raised its benchmark interest rate last year, but yet to be resolved. Policymakers aim to narrow current account deficit to 2.5% of GDP by end of this year, from 3.3% last year and towards 2% in 2015, which would in turn provide a fundamental support to the rupiah. However, a ban on mineral oil exports, weakening coal and palm oil exports, and lower oil production could exacerbate Indonesia's budget at, as well as current car deficits. Having said that, we also see signs that Indonesia is benefiting from global cyclical recovery as trade balance 
rebound in May, while the ban on mineral oil exports would likely to benefit the country in long term. Looking into the stock markets, JCI has rallied 18.65% year-to-date, currently trading at 20.49 times of its PE, slightly above its 52 weeks trading PE, and it is valued at 16.35 times estimated 12-month earnings, with a consensus earnings forecast growth to grow at 50.86% year-on-year. We expect a near-term volatility post-election, as investors may book gains into potential market rally post-election, but reforms agenda as well as timeline may limit market upside. To sum up, structural reforms 2.0 is required for the new Indonesia. The challenge will remain as how the new leader would act to close the gap for current account as well as to rein in inflation, while deploying reform measures to improve quality of life and raise productivity as well as competitiveness of the country. Thereby, we upgrade Indonesia to overweight from underweight on bet on Jokowi's victory leading to a cleaner and efficient administration in Southeast Asia's largest economy. The reform stories remain intact. With that, I have come to the end of the presentation. Thank you for watching this week's Market Watch. I'm Lin Sin from Philip Securities Research. Tune in for more Market Watch videos.